Hello everyone, bringing you a video today talking about this. And this is a relatively recently arrived item in the collection. It's a second pattern Denison smock. It featured in a video recently where I looked at some recently arrived bits and pieces, drew some interest, so I thought I'd make a follow-up video talking about this in more detail without too much delay. I'm very pleased to have this in the collection. Obviously airborne clothing is somewhat iconic. It's very desirable from a collector's point of view, so it's very nice to have one of these. In the video, I will talk a little bit about the difference between this and the first pattern, but it's not primarily talking about the history of the garment as in general. It's talking about this specific example, and we're going to talk, talk about this, look at the various details, turn it inside out, and so forth, as we usually do. A little bit of a preamble here. Obviously, these are a very iconic bit of kit, introduced during the course of the Second World War, and there are direct descendants of these still in use. The parachute is smock, of course, made in MTP, and the parachute regiment have fought quite hard over the years to maintain that individual element of their clothing and equipment in terms of having a specific smock designed for parachutists. Of course, these patterns were used by Royal Marines as well, and it's likely that this particular example was used by a Royal Marine, which we'll see when we turn this inside out and have a look at the other details. The second patent was introduced in 1944. This particular example is dated 1948. The second pattern design, which we have here, governed immediate post-war manufacture as well. So we'll talk about this in more detail now. We'll have a look at the various features, turn it inside out, have a look at the interior as we normally do, and obviously have a look at the label in some detail as well. So at the front here, we can see carried across from the first design. This is a half fronted garment. It's designed to be put on over the head. The zip only opens halfway down, as you can see here. But underneath this flap here, we do have a half length heavy duty brass zip. The zip has a cloth pull tab formed from the same camouflage drill or twill material used to make the smock zip that up there. It can be zipped all the way up to the top if required. And you can see the, the flap runs all the way down the front there to conceal the zip. The collar itself is lined with khaki flannel cloth, as you can see there. Again, a carryover from the first pattern. The pocket layout is basically the same with the four pockets at the front here. Pointed pocket flaps, simple patch pockets, and they close with a Nui press stud, as you can see there. Again, something carried right the way through to the modern day with parachutist smocks, the pockets and so forth closing with press studs as opposed to Velcro or buttons. So that's a design feature which would carry right the way through to the modern day. You also have extensive use of press studs used elsewhere on the garment. You can see the panel at the front here, which would allow the tail to be buttoned up through the crutch. And obviously you've got three points of adjustment there for securing this so the smock doesn't ride up during a jump. That's the initial intention of this anyway. So that's basically the details we have at the front here. You can see the details of the construction, the seams and so forth. Another feature which is quite nice on this particular example is the brush stroke camouflage has survived quite well. It's not particularly faded, which is great. A lovely camouflage pattern. From a collector's point of view, I really like this camouflage pattern. And obviously it would go on to inspire further developments in printed camouflage post-war. And there were various patterns which derive directly from this. Looking at the right-hand side of the smock here, the first detail to talk about is the epaulette up on the shoulder here, which is affixed into the shoulder seam, as you can see there. At the top, it's secured by a single four-hole battle dress type button, which you can see there. Those are also used on the cuff to draw in the cuff using this little tab here. There's a single button here, which secures the tab out of the way when it's not in use and stops it flapping around. And then you have two buttons here to draw the cuff in around the wrist as required. This is a difference between the second pattern and the first pattern. The second pattern introduced this method, this simplified method of uh, drawing in the cuff. The first pattern has a knitted cuff, which obviously automatically pulls in around the wrist. It's elastic and, and pulls in around the wrist to keep the smock somewhat more windproof. This was not a popular change in the second pattern. So post-war, when the design was further updated, the knitted cuff would be in, reintroduced and has carried through to the modern parachutist smocks today. But this is a, a very, a key visual difference with the second pattern when comparing it to the first pattern. There are also detailed differences with the cut and one of those is actually the shape of the sleeves. Uh, they're no longer tapered, they're a straight, straight sleeve all the way down to the bottom, the same width all the way down basically. But that's a, a less obvious visual difference between this and the first pattern. If we lift the sleeve up out of the way, you can see here underneath we have ventilation underneath the arm here. You have stitched in eyelets and this reinforced section here just to give a little bit of ventilation under the arm there. A feature carried across from the first pattern are the adjustment tabs at the bottom. And you can see these here on the bottom hem. We have a tab with a female Nui press stud affixed to it there. And then the male section is right on the bottom edge there. And you can just use those to draw in the bottom hem of this around the hips. We have one of those on each side as we'll see when we move this round. 
looking at the back of the smock here, we have the other very obvious visual difference between this and the first pattern, and that is the inclusion of female press studs here, which will allow for the tail to be buttoned out of the way. The tail's been removed from this particular smock, but that could be buttoned up out of the way. And this is a feature which would carry through again through the subsequent designs of Denison and parachutist smocks. This wasn't present on the first pattern, so the tail in that instance was sometimes buttoned round to the side adjustment tab to keep it out of the way. This was a good addition to the design, as I say, it would be carried forward on subsequent designs of parachutist or airborne smocks. Down the centre line here we have a seam running all the way down, but otherwise you have a nice view of the camouflage print at the back here with two large panels each side of that rear seam. So, as I say, a nice example of the brush stroke camouflage again here. And moving around to look at the left hand side, there's not a lot more to say here, really there's not, not a lot more to see other than the fact it's a mirror image of the other side. We have the epaulette here, the same cuff adjustment, obviously ventilation eyelets under the arm there, and again the adjustment tab down at the bottom here as you can see. We'll turn this inside out now and have a look at the interior details and the label. Looking at the internals of the front of the smock here, you can first of all see we have a double layer of cloth over the shoulders here, coming down to this row of stitching underneath the internal breast pockets there. You can also see here the wool flannel lining, the khaki wool flannel lining to the collar there as well. In addition to the four external pockets, we do have these two internal breast pockets, which you can see here, and these are formed of the same camouflage printed cloth as the rest of the smock, as you can see. Underneath these, you can see the stitching for the two breast pockets there, and down below, you can see the stitching for the two lower pockets. These, of course, have strips of cloth to reinforce where the flaps attach. Another point of reinforcement is here at the front where the various press studs are affixed, obviously to allow the tail to be secured through the crutch, obviously giving different heights of attachment for different lengths of rise. So you've got the adjustment there for the wearer at the front there. And obviously you need that reinforcement to make sure these are securely affixed to the garment. We have the label down at the front here and we'll get a close up of this now. You can see the label reads Smock Denison Airborne Troops, size four, which is height five foot six to five foot eight breast 39 to 41 inches, and this is manufactured by John Gordon and Company in 1948. Moving around to look at the internal details of the sleeve, we can see that that row of stitching on the outside corresponded to where we have this double layer of cloth at the top of the sleeve here. There is also a double layer of cloth reinforcing where the adjustment tab and the buttons are attached towards the bottom of the sleeve here, and you can just see how the sleeve is finished off there by turning the cloth back on itself. If we lift this up here, we can have a look underneath. You can see we again have reinforcement under the arm here as well, where those ventilation eyelets are worked into the design there. Looking at the back of the smock here, you can see the double layer of cloth over the shoulders here, and the line of stitching for that at the bottom here, which we saw when we looked at the outside details. If I turn the collar up here, it's a bit easier to see the wool lining, the wool flannel lining to the collar there as well. You can see how that's stitched in here. The single seam running down the centre line here, obviously you have the double layer of cloth at the bottom here as well. You have the two, uh, the inside face of the two press studs which would secure the tail up against the back when not required. You can also see the detail at the bottom here where that's been removed, it's been cut out. You can see the raw edge of the cloth here where that's just been cut off, but that's where it would have attached into the bottom hem of the smock there. The detail which leads me to believe this is Royal Marine issue is the number stamped in at the bottom here, it's upside down. We'll have a look at that in detail the right way up so you can see that number and uh, obviously this is the reason I believe that this is Royal Marine issue. And you can see detail of that number stamped in here, 23020752. I haven't yet had an opportunity to research this but I will be doing at some point going forward. So I hope you found it interesting looking at this. I am certain that many of my viewers, many of you out there are very familiar with these garments so this will be nothing new but hopefully it's nevertheless been interesting having a look at this, turning it inside out, having a look at the internal details and so forth. Uh, as I say, I hope it's been of use. Obviously, this may inform you if you're buying a reproduction of one of these, potentially if you're a reenactor or, or something of that nature. Uh, if you wanted to buy a reproduction, obviously hopefully looking at an original in some detail in this video may inform your decisions about buying a reproduction and where you're going to get yours from. As I say, hopefully this video has been useful in at least some regard in looking at this in more detail. If you have found this interesting and you'd like to see more from the channel, please do consider subscribing if you haven't already. And whether you're newly subscribing or you've previously subscribed, please do make sure you hit the little bell, the notification button down below. That will of course alert you when I upload future videos. If you really like my uploads and you'd like to support the channel, you can. Both Patreon and PayPal are linked down below. And as ever, a massive thank you to everybody who supports the channel using those two methods. It's greatly appreciated, as I always say. Thank you all very much indeed. And a brief note here as well, 
Videos are now being uploaded directly on Patreon so that patrons can watch them ad-free. If you'd like to follow the channel on social media, you can. Facebook, Instagram and Twitter are all linked down below. And if you'd like to get in touch but you don't really use social media, there is of course an email address down there as well. That's everything for this video, so until next time, bye for now.